This LIT video is on Approach to Respiratory Distress. In this video, you will learn the following. Respiratory distress is characterized by the constellation of clinical features that indicate increased work of breathing, such as tachypnea, nasal flaring, retractions, use of accessory muscles, and abnormal breath sounds. It is a common pediatric emergency accounting for approximately 10% of A&E visits in children's hospitals and 20% of hospitalizations. It is important to promptly recognize respiratory compromise in children as they can decompensate rapidly. Compared to adults, kids have smaller airways, increased oxygen demands, decreased reserves, and inadequate compensatory mechanisms. Respiratory failure results when respiratory efforts cannot maintain adequate ventilation or oxygenation. Respiratory arrest is the most common cause of collapse in children. Disorders in any system can cause respiratory compromise. Respiratory causes include infections, obstruction, chest wall and thoracic abnormalities, trauma, embolism, and injuries. Cardiovascular causes include congenital heart disease, heart failure, cardiac tamponade, and infections. Severe anemia and sequel crises are some hematological causes of respiratory distress. Hypoventilation due to neurological insults, abdominal trauma, distension, and aspiration of gastric contents can result in respiratory compromise. Metabolic causes such as acidosis, hyperthyroidism, and hyperammonemia can result in respiratory distress. A detailed history can point to the cause of respiratory distress. A short onset is commonly due to infective causes, especially if there is also fever. A sudden onset associated with trauma or chest pain may be due to a pneumothorax. A gradual onset can suggest heart failure or metabolic causes. Chronic stridor can be due to anatomical aberrancies. Associated symptoms can narrow down the diagnosis. Infective causes commonly have fever, URTI symptoms such as cough, runny nose, hoarse voice. Chest pain can occur in pneumonia, myocarditis, and pericarditis. Abdominal pain accompanying the respiratory distress may be due to gastrointestinal causes or metabolic problems, like DKA or a serious acute abdomen. For example, abdominal pain with vomiting may indicate diabetic ketoacidosis. The tachypnea is a compensatory response to the severe acidosis. Angioedema with respiratory distress suggests anaphylaxis, while orthopnea can indicate congestive cardiac failure. It is also important to elicit a history of events prior to the onset of breathlessness. Recent trauma can cause potentially life-threatening tension pneumothorax, hemothorax, or flail chest. One should also check if there had been any exposure to new drugs, foods, and other precipitants or allergens such as weather changes and animals, as this could point towards anaphylaxis or an acute asthma exacerbation. A past history of previous recurrent wheezes and ATOP such as allergic rhinitis and eczema points to asthma or bronchial hyperreactivity. Asthmatic patients have an increased risk of pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. Chronic lung disease in ex premature babies increases the risk of infections. A family history of ATOP or heart disease can suggest the same cause. Vaccinations such as Haemophilus influenza type B can make certain etiologies such as epiglottitis less likely. A feeding history in a young child such as gasping for air, vomiting and choking, or worsening tolerance during feeding with gradually worsening respiratory distress can suggest heart failure or aspiration. Polyuria and polydipsia can indicate diabetes. In the examination of an acutely sick child in respiratory distress, do an initial rapid assessment to quickly identify life-threatening conditions which will require immediate and aggressive interventions to stabilize the child prior to a complete history of physical examination. This includes severe or rapidly progressing upper airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and respiratory failure. In the initial rapid assessment, check the vital signs, temperature, respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, heart rate, and blood pressure. Normal respiratory rate and heart rate are generally inversely proportional to age. Fever itself can increase the respiratory rate by about 7 breaths per degree rise. Conversely, apnea and bradypnea can be seen in neonates and infants due to respiratory muscle fatigue, neurological causes, 
or severe metabolic acidosis. Oxygen saturation should be more than 95% in room air. Tachycardia can be caused by respiratory distress or fever. Bradycardia, however, suggests impending arrest. Look at the general appearance of the child. Is the child toxic? Are there dysmorphisms? Is the child well hydrated? A hypoxic child may be restless, anxious or combative. Hypoxia can also manifest as somnolence or lethargy, along with cyanosis if severe. Children may assume positions of comfort to maximize airflow, such as the sniffing position with upper airway obstruction or tripod position in lower airway obstruction. The drooling or dysphagic child is likely to have severe upper airway obstructions along with no audible voice or cough. Listen also for audible abnormal respiratory noises such as wheeze, stridor and grunting. Examine the child's circulation. Look at the perfusion, check for cyanosis, feel for the pulses and check the capillary refill time. Check the child's Glasgow Coma Scale. Is there an altered mental status? To suggest a neurological cause for the respiratory distress? Look for angioedema, which could suggest anaphylaxis. Once the initial assessment is done, a more thorough examination should be performed. Feel for adequate and symmetrical chest expansion, and check for any crepitus and tactile fremitus. Percuss for dullness or hyperresonance. Auscultate for differences in air entry, crepitations, wheezes, and rubs. Listen to the heart sounds for regularity, muffling, murmurs, gallop rhythm, to suggest cardiac pathologies such as tamponade or heart failure resulting in respiratory distress. Be sure not to miss the abdomen for any distension, organomegaly, or splinting due to pain. Also, examine the peripheries to look for further clues such as raised JVP and peating edema in cardiac failure, conjunctival pallor in anemia, signs of infections such as lymph adenopathy, tonsillitis, and so on. This table shows the normal ranges of heart rates and respiratory rates in children up to 18 years of age. As mentioned, heart rates and respiratory rates are inversely proportional to age. Immediate stabilization is vital in the management of a child in respiratory distress. Give oxygen, relieve any obstruction, and ventilate with a bag and mask if necessary. Intubation is indicated if the child is unable to maintain adequate oxygenation such as in pulmonary disease or worsening respiratory effort. If the child is unable to maintain and or protect the airway such as in complete obstruction, worsening of partial obstruction, and impaired mental status where there is risk of loss of protective airway reflexes and therefore aspiration. And if there is potential for clinical deterioration such as those with thermal inhalation injuries or epiglottitis. Some conditions require immediate interventions such as needle decompression of attention pneumothorax and chest tube insertion or pericardiosynthesis in cardiac tamponade. Other illnesses such as severe anaphylaxis or asthma exacerbations may require initial aggressive medical therapies. Not all children in respiratory distress need investigations. Certain conditions such as asthma, which improves with bronchodilators, do not need further tests. Some with severe respiratory distress will need an arterial or capillary blood gas to determine oxygenation and assess the need for further airway interventions such as intubation. A full blood count may be done in suspected infections. Electrolytes and blood glucose may be done in suspected metabolic causes. Imaging such as chest x-rays can be done to look for consolidation, collapse, effusions, and pneumothoraces. Inspiratory and expiratory chest x-ray or lateral decubitus films can be done for suspected foreign bodies. Lateral neck x-rays look for soft tissue abnormalities such as retropharyngeal abscess, tracheitis, epiglottitis, and croup. A CT chest may be needed if abscesses, masses, or loculated effusions are suspected. An urgent 2D echocardiogram may be needed to look for effusions and to assess cardiac function. In conclusion, there is a need for initial rapid assessment to determine the severity of respiratory distress and any requirement for immediate management and stabilization. Intervention and diagnostic evaluation frequently occur concurrently. Respiratory distress may not be due to respiratory causes alone. If the lungs are clear, think out of the box. Quiz time. Question 1. Which of the following is not a sign of respiratory distress?
Question 2. Which of the following is an appropriate initial investigation to be done for a child with respiratory distress matched with the correct diagnosis? Question 3. The following are possible scenarios where intubation may be performed, except for The answer is A. 